Welcome back to Comics with Drew. This is Drew, and today we're going to review Star Wars The High Republic number one. A lot has been said about this book, and a lot has been said about the alleged civil war between the John Favreau de Filoni crowd and the Kathleen Kennedy I Hate Star Wars crowd. Now, I will freely admit that this book is not aimed at my demographic, the demographic that grew up watching the original Star Wars films, and I, by that I mean A New Hope, the Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. However, I'm still reading this book, and the problem here for Lucasfilm is that they are targeting a book to a demographic that A, doesn't like Star Wars, B, doesn't read comic books, and C, doesn't read comic books about Star Wars. So what winds up happening, it's a trap, what winds up happening is they put out these comic books, and the people that would buy the comic books are the people that would definitely not like The High Republic. So here we are. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to, first of all, review the book from a perspective of the target demographic, okay? This is the ideal person that Lucasfilm would like to be selling things to and making content for. That demographic would probably like this book. If you are aiming for people that uh, definitely are not conservative in any shape or form of the term and want to see themselves in every story rather than being entertained by seeing heroes that they can aspire to be, this book seems to be fitting the bill for what that particular demographic would want if they were to A, like Star Wars, and B, read comic books. That being said, what we have here is we have three people on the cover of this book. We have Avar Chris, who is the compassionately inspiring leader of the Jedi in the High Republic. And uh, we also have uh, Keeve here, who is our protagonist for this particular issue. And we have Skier here, who is the, uh, is the uh, master of Padawan Keeve. Skier and Keeve, these can get easily confused. Uh, I wish they would come up with better naming conventions for their characters. You know, I really wonder if there's some kind of style guide to uh, naming Star Wars characters. I can't really blame George Lucas for doing what he does and coming up with things like Count Dooku, but he's the one that created the universe, so I'm not going to really argue with him. Now, when you're hiring professional people to do professional things, you would think that they would come up with something a little bit easier to break apart rather than taking these two characters and giving them essentially very similar phonetic names. So Keeve here, Skier here, and Avar, Chris here. This is the cover. Cover looks fine. We've got a space station here in the front. And so let's go to page one here where we get a little bit of a timeline and we get a guide here to let us know where we are in the timeline of Star Wars. Here is where Lucasfilm wrecked Star Wars or Disney wrecked Star Wars. Here is uh, the New Republic where Jon Favreau is trying to resurrect Star Wars. This is the Age of the Rebellion where everybody fell in love with Star Wars. And then here is the Reign of the Empire, which also is Lucasfilm attempting to wreck Star Wars. And the Fall of the Jedi, which is the prequel trilogy. And now we have the High Republic. We don't have the Old Republic. I'm not sure if the Old Republic is going to be part of Disney Star Wars or not. I will tell you that I have never read any of those novels. I've never watched any of the cartoons or any of that stuff. I'm an old school Star Wars fan. I watch the movies that come out in theaters and that's pretty much it. And The Mandalorian. This is where we are. We're way back in the day here. And so we have a scroll that sets the story here. The High Republic. The galaxy is at peace ruled by the glorious Republic and protected by the noble and wise Jedi Knights. As a symbol of all that is good, the Republic is about to launch Starlight Beacon into the far reaches of the Outer Rim. This new space station will serve as a ray of hope for all to see. But just as a magnificent renaissance spreads throughout the Republic, so does a frightening new adversary. Now the Guardians of Peace and Justice must face a threat to themselves, the galaxy, and the Force itself. Dun dun dun! Yeah, none of this has anything to do with this particular book. We have our introduction. The first panel, we see our hero. Now, this is an archetype. This is who Disney wants to sell Star Wars to. They want to sell Star Wars to young people who shave half their head and are angry. <laughs> so, uh, we've got here, she's mad, she's bad, she's ready to roll. And so she starts talking basically to this uh, alien life form who she's pretty much ignoring. And we see an action pose here and we see someone looking. We don't really know what the context is of that until we get to the next page where uh, this turns out to be Skier. He is her master and she's showing up at this planet to meet him and 
go through some kind of trial to become an official Jedi Knight. And that's the general idea of what's going on here. So I'm not going to show you the next page here, but basically he kind of sneak attacks her and uh, then they exchange some pleasantries about, you know, why the Jedi Academy sucks and how she's there to become better or get trained by her master, Skier. Again, Skier, Keeve, I mean, it's, it's kind of weird. The trial here that Skier has set up for Keeve are the Needles. Uh, the Needles have stood for millennia. Many have tried to climb them. Many have failed. They are fragile and old. And I have hung a Tythonian pendant at the top of one of the peaks. And so naturally, Keeve says, I thought you said no one had climbed them. And he says, I said many have failed. And so she says, you have one arm. And he says, you are to choose a needle and recover the pendant. You will not fall. And you will not give up until it is in your grasp. And she goes, boy, they're just so tall. And then uh, Skier goes, are you scared? There's no fear, only certainty, she says. There's also a thing such as rhetoric. A Jedi does more than simply parrot ancient lore. Yeah, I, I, fair enough. So she goes up to attempt to climb up these needles here, and she winds up getting up about halfway, and then it falls, and then she pulls out the lightsaber, and she sticks the lightsaber into the needle, and this somehow slows her fall, and she winds up kind of resting there. Uh, I, th I think the writer uh, has acknowledged that this is not how lightsabers work. So I don't really need to get into it uh, other than you would want people writing this book who understand Star Wars and understand the universe and how physics work in the universe. This is one of my major, major complaints about The Last Jedi film is the fact that it breaks Star Wars physics. This breaks Star Wars physics. So again, right, right here, you're pissing off the people who are going to be buying this book, not the people who will never see the book that would typically not care about it but they're never going to see the book. <laughs> so that's, that's a big problem. Ultimately, the reason why she started falling down from the needles is you have this giant migration of space bugs here and they are being directed to, or they're being misdirected to where they typically migrate to by the Starlight Beacon space station that we uh, have, see on the cover. And Keeve decides that she's going to go fix this problem and she comes down from the needle, picks up in the spacecraft and takes off, blowing off her master skier. And she's like, I don't, he doesn't need to hear what I have to do. I've got a choice. I'm going to go do what I need to do. And this kind of mimics the way Luke Skywalker acts in Empire Strikes Back, where he ignores Yoda and he ignores Obi-Wan and he goes off to face Vader. And I don't really care about spoilers and I'm not going to really get into what happens. The point of what I'm trying to say here is she winds up succeeding in what she needs to do. She uh, redirects these migrating bugs to wherever they need to go. Keeve winds up being told to try to listen to the bugs to find out where they're going and why they're going. And that's when she appears to delve into the Force gossip line here. Uh, this is a uh, telepathic thing where she can just communicate with uh, different alien life forms through the Force, I guess. I've never heard of this power. So once again, we have another superpower Jedi with made up powers in the middle of nowhere. Feel free to correct me in the comments if you disagree or if somebody else has this power. I honestly don't care. Like I said, I don't read the extended universe. I only watch the films and The Mandalorian and no one else has this ability in the force. But we have our targeted character to a demographic who, of course, you know, looks like Storm from the X-Men. She winds up communicating with the bugs, figures out where they need to go and leads them to the right place. And so ultimately you have a Padawan, she shows up, she is given a task, she blows off the task because something else happens and she finds that's more important. So she flies off with the spacecraft, blows off everybody that's telling her what to do. But it turns out that, surprise, this was all part of the test. And not only uh, did you pass the test, but boom, you get to be a Jedi Knight. And then we have this weird lightsaber cutting off your hair. I've, ne <laughs> I've never really heard of that. I've never seen that. But the bottom line here is that Keeve winds up blowing off her master, then gets rewarded for it and everything works out just fine. And I guess the whole moral of the story is that if you're doing the right thing, it doesn't matter what anybody's telling you to do. It doesn't matter what you've been directed to do. Thinking differently is what rewards you. I wish thinking differently would reward everybody else in the world that typically would be reading this book. The book, I think, appeals to nobody. It appeals to someone who's not going to read the book, in my opinion. Uh, it's like if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Well, no, not really, as far as, it, uh, as far as it's concerned with people that are listening to it. The only people that would be listening to it don't care. And Star Wars fans, traditional Star Wars fans that would be buying comic books, don't care about this. So yeah, so the book is okay. The art is fine. There's nothing wrong with the art. 
the story itself is fine, I suppose. It doesn't really fit in typical Star Wars conventions, but oh well, you know. I mean, it's it's not really aimed at, I think, Star Wars fans. It's aimed at people who they want to become Star Wars fans, which I think is one of the main failings of Disney Star Wars over the past six, seven years. They, they just don't seem to really understand that all you need to do is appeal to the fan base for Star Wars and their kids are going to become Star Wars fans as well. But we are where we are and, and this is where it's going. I don't really see this being a successful book going forward. They would have to shake it up with some other things that appeal to standard Star Wars fans. But that's my opinion. So, you know, if you read the book, if you like the book, go ahead and let me know in the comments and tell me where I'm wrong. That's fine. If I were going to give this a star rating, uh, I would probably give this a two and a half. It's two and a half because it's not badly produced. It's just not really that great. And it's kind of got some inconsistencies with Star Wars uh, physics. And it's appealing to people that don't like Star Wars in general. So I, I'm not really sure why they're intending, they intend on doing this. But, you know, when you're Disney and you've got money to burn, you got money to burn. Sometimes you just got to, sometimes you just have to get that money burned. <laughs> so again, this is uh, Comics with Drew. My name is Drew. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you want to hear more of my ramblings about comics and pop culture, and I'll see you next time.